All right, man. Episode 44 of the Cozy Corner of Cinema. This is being recorded on January 27th, 2023 at 9.11 a.m. The snow is almost completely gone from outside. We had some storms previously that really hit hard, and it was such a joy to see just these open, vast areas of white. It was beautiful, man. Truly beautiful. But it looks like it's mostly gone. Only fragments of what was, and perhaps what will come to be. Hope your week has been well. This has been a very busy week, I must say. This this past week has been uh, quite something else. There has truly not been not enough time in the day for everything that has to get done and everything that needs to get done. But we manage, and we do what we can with the time allotted to us while we still have it. And it is important not to waste that time uh, on things you don't want to do. So the Oscar nominations were this week, and the Oscars are fun. You know, man, I used to take them a lot more seriously. I used to get, when I was younger, get upset. Oh, this wasn't uh, nominated, this wasn't nominated, and ultimately you realize that it's all meaningless. It's all unimportant. Um, But they are fun. It's fun to discuss what gets nominated, uh, what you think will win. Uh, what you think uh, should have been nominated, you know, things like that. I don't, you know, when it comes to the Oscars, uh, it's it's important not to take it too seriously. I think the I think it's fun to watch. Um, rarely do I watch the whole ceremony. Usually, I just look up highlights and all that. But uh, the way I see it, it's a good way. It, it, I look at the Oscars the same way I look at when people do their best of lists or when recently when sight and sound did their updated best films list you know I, people can go oh they left out this film or this film's too high or this to me i just look at both of these as opportunities to see films that i hadn't seen before so i look and i go oh i haven't I, that must be a a pretty good film if it got all this all this talk so i should i should definitely go see that man it's all in good fun it's fun to see who gets nominated I don't pay any attention to the Razzies or any of that stuff. I, I didn't even know that that was uh, uh, happening again, um, to be honest. I saw somebody had mentioned it to me, and uh, I didn't look at it or anything like that. I don't I don't really have any interest in uh, dogpiling on someone else's art. And uh, an acquaintance of mine brought that up to me because they knew how much I was a fan of Andrew Dominic's Blonde, a, a divisive film. And apparently it got like eight or nine <clears throat> Razzie nominations and, and, uh, it didn't phase me. It, it to me, I, I don't take it seriously. I just, yeah, they didn't like it. They didn't like it. It's not a thumb for everybody. Um, and that's all there is to it, man. You can't take this stuff too seriously, but it is fun. So, uh, I'm not gonna do predictions or anything like that. There's a million videos talking about what they think will win or what they've got snubs and that. I'm, I'm just looking at the best picture stuff here. I think I'd talk about these films. Just briefly, some of which I've uh, mentioned before on the show and others I haven't mentioned. And I've seen all of these except for Avatar The Way of Water, um, which I don't intend on seeing. But the other nine I have all seen. And this is uh, actually quite a good year, I would say, because I, I actually like all nine films that I have seen. Um, some more than others, of course. But I think all nine, uh, if any of them won Best Picture, I wouldn't be upset. I'd be like, oh, that's a good choice, you know. So I guess I'll run, run through these kind of briefly. Move on to the next point of the show. I'm just going to sip my beverage here and we'll go right into it. Mm. All right, so first one here. Uh, now, I should say up front, uh, in terms of the Underseen 2022 episode I intended on doing, um, I'll, I'll discuss more about why I'll probably just talk about select titles here instead of making that episode for the reason of the Oscar nominations, but I'll get, in, I'll get into more of that after because one of the films that I had on my list that I thought was underseen, but apparently is not, was the uh, German remake of All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, This was an Amazon film, and I hope, like I said before, with a lot of uh, uh, streaming titles, a lot of streaming films, is that I hope this will get a physical release, um, because I thought this was uh, such a terrific film. I'm admittedly not familiar and haven't seen the 1930 film, but this is, you know, I'm... If I'm, be, I'm just keep really big on war films, and I, I think that we've gotten just so many good ones in the past couple of years. You know, Fury and 1917 and Dunkirk. It's just all, all, all terrific films, and, and this is definitely one to be added to the roster. Um, this was directed by Edward Berger, who I don't know if I'm familiar with his previous work or not. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at him here, and I don't think I've seen his previous stuff. 
Um, but this is this is a, an incredible film. Uh, it, it's a two and a half hours, but it, it flies by uh, at, at such a brisk pace. So much so that when it was over, um, I was actually surprised. I had been sitting there for two and a half hours. Um, I think probably the biggest name in this is probably Daniel Bruhl who has been in uh, uh, just a bunch of films, man. He's one of these guys, you see him and you go, oh, he, I, I think he was in the um, some of the Marvel stuff. I, yeah, it looks like he was, but he's a great actor. And the, just the pure craziness of combat in this, it's, I mean, it's, they do a really great job at putting you in perspective of these soldiers in these trenches, man, because they, they show just sticking your head up for a second is, li- is a split second is life or death, and they show just truly how frightening and and chaotic it is i i love this film man this was one of the best films i had seen last year and um like i said i really hope this gets a blu-ray and and uh, i i definitely want to watch the 1930 film but it's a very um bleak film very nihilistic and dark uh as it should be but terrific nonetheless a very fantastic film um like i said i hadn't seen avatar the way of water um the banshees of inishirin uh, now, I didn't make a top favorites of the year or anything like that. I, I put together um, I, I put together 25 of my favorites, just in alphabetical order. I don't think I ever talked about that on the show. I should probably find that list somewhere. But um, if there was any, ever a film close to being a favorite of the year, because I, I mean, I know it's ironic that I, I do top lists of years, but uh, ultimately I don't like to pit films against each other because of different reactions, different contexts. But like I said, the list videos are all for fun. But with that said... Um, the Banshee's Men of Sheeran was probably the closest to being a favorite of last year. This and Montana Story, uh, which is a very underseen film from last year. Um, I, yeah, like, I mean, I love this film, man. Martin McDonough's fourth film as well, um, uniting uh, Brendan Gleeson and uh, Colin Farrell, um, as well as, I didn't even, I completely forgot that uh, Colin Farrell and Barry Keegan had been in The Killing of a Sacred Deer together uh, by Yaros Lanthimos, so that's pretty funny. Uh, to see them together in this, along with uh, Carrie Condon, and whoever, man, whoever plays that donkey, man, was that Jenny? Oh, man, so I'm, as somebody, I saw somebody make a joke that, that Jenny should have gotten an Oscar nomination, and I'm totally there for it. Uh, this is one that's just been sticking around with me I, I, since I've seen it. I've, I've only watched it once in the cinema, and um, it's out on Blu-ray now, it's on HBO Max, and actually it's coming back, a lot of these films are coming back to cinema, to the cinema. But Martin McDonough, I just think is one of, I've said it before and I'll say it again, I think he's one of the best filmmakers and writers working of our time right now. Um, every film of his has been great. Um, I mean, In Bruges is just one of my favorite films, period. Uh, Seven Psychopaths uh, is, is, a, is a departure, but still really great. Uh, great performances in that, great character actors in that. Um, Three Billboards got a lot of Oscar talk, and I, it's another one that I haven't seen since the cinema, but I have the Blu-ray event, and I love that film as well. Um, uh, just really solid character writing in that, and the, the Banshees of Inisherin as well. I, this is just such a funny, but also in the you know very emotional film. Great back and forth between Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson of just two opposite kinds of characters, uh, and just the way that McDonough writes his characters, man. There's so much go- so much more going on to them, and so much more backstory with them that either that doesn't show on screen, but you, you get the idea of, um, and and even even when you know uh, 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 things get more serious between the two leads. I think both performances are still strong enough that you still find yourself kind of liking both of them to an extent, you know, even when something egregious happens uh, in one of the best scenes in the film. Uh, but, I mean, I've talked about this film before on the show. I'm not going to go too much more into it, but, yeah, closest thing to probably a favorite of 2022. Really, really love this film. Um, let's see, Elvis, I've talked about briefly on one of the Blu-ray episodes. And um, this is an interesting film because, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the, the music of Elvis. I think Elvis is a very fascinating uh, pop culture character. I think he's a very fascinating person. And um, I've said before I didn't love the film. But uh, there is a lot that is really good in this. Um, I mean, it goes without saying, Austin Butler, um, if there was ever one, I mean, I don't know who's nominated for Best Actor. I, I think Brendan Fraser and Colin Farrell, and uh, I can't remember the other two. Uh, but either way, I think Austin Butler, to me, uh, gave the best performance of last year, and, and I hope he wins the Best Actor because it goes beyond just doing an Elvis impersonation, uh, which has been done to death, uh, but it's more so the way he plays it, and I think uh, ultimately a problem that I have with the film is that his performance is so good that it kind of shows 
the the lack in the in the rest of the film because I, I think a big thing about the film that I, I kind of wanted more of was, was a little bit more of a of a human side to Elvis where Elvis is as a person is such a big pop culture icon it, it transcends being just a person that there are moments in this that show him as a, as a you know as a real person with feelings and uh, and one of the best scenes in the film when he lashes out at uh, Tom Parker played by Tom Hanks that. Uh, didn't even really happen. I mean, I don't care about factual inaccuracies or anything like that. I don't, I don't care about any of that as long as the film's good. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I, it's not quite the film I wanted it to be. But with that said, there are a lot of just great, great directed sequences in this. I'm not the biggest Boz Lerman fan, admittedly, but there are some sequences when he's playing and the camera work that he does, certain color schemes that are going on. I mean, there is so much in this film that is so well done. And um, I know a double-edged sword to this, that this has so much energy and is constantly moving. You hear these songs and it just pumps you up. But the other end of that sword is that I do feel like the film is a little too energetic. Um, I made the joke to an acquaintance of mine. I said, you know, I, I don't think there's many shots in the film that last more than five seconds. It's very fast, very moving. And that's why, kind of going into before what I was talking about with that, I wish, I, I wish there was something a little more personal. I'm very interested in that upcoming Priscilla film that A24 is distributing. I'm, I'm wondering if that'll be a little bit more human, uh, uh, a, more of a human side to these characters, to these people, I should say. But... I did like the film, and, and plus, I mean, just seeing it theatrically, hearing these great songs in, in a big cinema, you know, I don't know if this went to IMAX or not, but I would have loved to have seen this in IMAX, just hearing these songs pumping through the speakers, man, I I really like this film, man, you know, it's one that I do want to watch again, because maybe I'll feel a little stronger on it, um, it just is a shame that it's not quite the great film I was hoping for, but, uh, but it is a good film nonetheless, and man, Austin Butler just kills it in this film, man, just, and what an amazing performance. Uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. This was from earlier in the year, and this was a really good film as well. I think, um, you know, of all the films on the list, I think this is probably the one that most people have seen has got the most attention, and and right and and as it should, you know, I was a big fan of Dan Kwan and Daniel Sh- uh, Sh- Sh- Shinerts. I know they go by the Daniels. Uh, their previous film, Swiss Army Man, and while I like that film. A lot more. I think this is a very good film as well. Um, the two leads in the film, especially, I think. I mean, Michelle Yeoh is is fantastic. She's just one of the one of my favorite actors working. Um, but especially uh, Ki Hu Kwan, man, I loved his performance in the film. He has such a charming charisma to to his performance. And there's a, one of my favorite sequences in the film is when uh, Evelyn, played by Michelle Yeoh, is thinking back to uh, some times in her life with, with this char- his character uh, Waymond. And you just see what a what a just a charismatic actor he is, and how enjoyable it. Anytime he's on screen, I mean, I know Michelle Yeoh is the lead of the film, but I, I think he really steals a lot of the film for for me. Um, but Michelle, but when they work together, they're fantastic. Um, admittedly, I wasn't, I didn't quite love the film. I, I think a, a problem that I have with the film, which is a problem that I have actually with a couple films on this list, is it is a a little too long, but unnecessarily long. Where about halfway through the film, I remember sitting in the cinema thinking to myself, I'm not exactly sure what the main threat is. I know they're jumping between worlds and all this and parallel dimensions, but I don't totally understand what the real threat is. I mean, not entirely, but that's okay. I'm watching it and I'm like, okay, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. There's a lot of really funny laugh, a lot of moments. I think most of the comedy works, some of it, not so much for me, but I mean, when there's so many jokes in the film, it's not all going to work. Uh, some of the, you know, uh, some of the sight gags and the bagel stuff, it didn't really work for me, but, um, and the third act, I think, really drags for me. Um, I, it just goes on way too long, man. And the third act is a problem is that it feels like like the character Evelyn is going to every single character and having a big Oscar moment where, you know, ultimately the message of the film is very good. And it was very, I really like the ending. It's very heartwarming. But I do think that it is just too damn long, man. It, I mean, I, this, is, uh, all, this is almost two and a half hours. And for a film that is constantly moving, constantly energetic. At a certain point, I found myself, like the Elvis film, which I also thought was a little too long, but at a certain point, I'm going, all right, I, this this is a bit much. Like, you know, I, I kind of wanted this to wrap up. Uh, I know she'll my, also, also mention Jamie Lee Curtis and James Hong, who are, both have small parts of the film, but it's good as well. Um, but with that said, man, you watch this film and you're like, wow, this is a film that these guys really wanted to make. The total creativity, the love of different influences they have in the film, of martial arts cinema, of the, the Wong Kar Wai references. Uh, you just watch this film, and even though I didn't love it, Man, I'm just glad we get films like this because just the pure originality. A film like uh, you can have a film be nominated for Best Picture, where one of the 
one of the conflicts in a movie is characters trying to stick something up their ass. And I think that's great. You know, I'm, I'm more for just crazy stuff like that. Uh, but I, like I said, I really enjoyed this film, but I think most people have seen it. Um, I'm going to have to speed this up a little bit. I'm talking a bit too much about some of these films. Uh, the Fablemans, the new Steven Spielberg film. Um, again, you know, I, I like the film. It's, I like all these films, but this was one that admittedly didn't totally work for me, but I did like it. So I don't want to act like I didn't. Um, I mean, this is, uh, when it comes, I think this is Spielberg's most, uh, interesting original film in a, in a, in a little while. I do enjoy his, uh, remake of West Side Story a lot. Um, but this is a, this is a film that I, I the intentions, I think kind of outmatch the quality overall. It, it, it is, I have a lot of problems with this film and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to just sit here and, and be a jerk and like rail against certain things. So I'll just say, I, I, I wish this was a you know, maybe not quite as Spielbergian as uh, I wish. But with that said, I mean, I think uh, a lot of the performances of this film are very good. Uh, the kid who plays uh, the teenage version of Sammy, I uh, was this Gabriel LaBelle, very good in the film. Um, and there, are, and there are just some of really some really terrific moments in the film. One of my there two of my favorite sequences in the film are one, you have a small role by. John Hirsch, which was great to see, where he's talking to Sammy as a kid, and he's saying, like, you know, you got to do it, you got to be crazy, you got to do what you have to do if you if you want to make these films, you got to do it. And, and, it's, and it's a moment of the film that doesn't feel cliche, it doesn't feel Disney Channel-esque, like some of the some of the other scenes in the film are kind of a problem with, um, but it feels like, ah, oh, what a nice, heartwarming scene. And um, one of the best scenes in the film is when Sammy, uh, he, he is just, he's piecing together uh, this mystery uh, so something, something that he's not totally sure of, and he's putting all the films in and going back and forth, and it's a scene that has no dialogue. It goes on for it takes its time and 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 paces itself out, but it's like wow, this is actually more hard hitting than a lot of the other scenes in the film. This is a really great uh, sequence. Um, yeah, I, I maybe my least favorite of the nominations, but it is still good. I mean, you see you see you see the heart in it from uh, uh, Spielberg's directing, all the performances in the film. I mean, its intentions are good, so I can't possibly be, say too much negative about a film like this that has all the best intentions in the world. Plus, it has a great cameo at the end of uh, one of the best directors playing one of the best directors. So, and it's, I mean, it's great. It's, it's, well, it's a hilarious sequence. And um, I did like the film, though. I, 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 I totally get why people um, uh, are really high on it. And that's great. And I think if you're curious about it, you should definitely uh, uh, go see it for sure. Um, but good stuff here overall. Uh, let's see here. I'm just making sure I have enough time left for... Oh, yeah, I got some time. Okay. Tar, the new Todd Fields film starring Kate Blanchett. Uh, another one that when I initially walked out of the cinema, I didn't... I mean, I liked it, but I was like, oh, I don't know how to feel about this. I There's a lot that's good, a lot that's not so good. Eh. Um, and then the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, no, nah, this is a really solid film for sure. Kate Blanchett... Which I I remember when I walked into the cinema. For some reason, I thought this was based on a true story. So when they're talking about brand new twenty twenty one stuff, I was like, oh, I guess maybe maybe it's not based on a true story. Um, Kate Blanchett plays Lydia Tarr, a world renowned, uh, just incredible composer, uh, one of the world's best. And we see in the first half uh, just her her life around her, her relationships with her colleagues, with her. Um, I think it was her wife or her girlfriend, I don't remember. Um, and then in, we see the cracks start to form, some problems start to occur, and then the second half is really kind of a downfall of this character. And, I mean, I think the the writing in this film is really solid. There are just some great sequences of this long dialogue that are fantastic, man. You see, you see just the, the slow cracks in Lydia Tarr's um, uh, personality, where she is a character who is... You, who is doing you know bad things, but it's not overt about it. And then when you realize when you're in the third act of the film or the second half, I should say, and you really start to see her kind of manipulating, but not overtly. Um, it, it's just it's solid, man. It, it's all solid. All, I, all the performances in this are great. Um, you have uh, uh, the other colleagues of hers that uh, I, I can't. I don't remember who played her wife or girlfriend, but she was good as well. Um, the the one who kind of goes under Lydia's wing. I don't know who that actor is. I apologize. Um, I don't want to just start naming names and and get and attribute it to the wrong person. Um, but all performances in this are great. I think Todd Fields. Uh, Todd Field, yeah, uh, his writing is really strong. Um, but like I said, I, like a, a problem I have with some other films, it is a little too long for this kind of film, my in my opinion. And the very end of the film, I would say probably the last ten minutes, I I think is a little drastic of where the film concludes to. I don't know if it would be that drastic in terms of 
it's hard, it's difficult to talk about in terms of real life um, people and real life events in terms of what happens to them. So I don't know if it, it's difficult to explain. I don't. I was talking about this with somebody, but I don't know if it would quite get to that to be that drastic. Where you know. But with that said, really enjoyed this film, man. One that you got to sit on. Um, the dialogue is great in the film. Cape Blanchett. It's one of the best performances of the year. A terrific film, man. I really, really like this one. Uh, Top Gun Maverick, man. Great to see this one nominated. I mean, if, geez, man. You got to give it to Tom Cruise, man. Him and James Cameron this year are really like, nah, man. Leave your house and let's go to the cinema. And by God, man, this film is so, so much fun, man. I rewatched this over Christmas with my parents. Uh, I had the 4K, but they uh, we, there was on, it was on streaming on Paramount. And uh, they were like, oh, let's watch a Paramount. So I was like, ah, oh, whatever. Fine. There was in 4K anyways, but... You know, in terms of uh, big action films, you know, this is one that people can say of certain uh, big films, oh, well, it's a big film, so you turn off your brain. And I don't think that's the case here, man. This is not a, a yeah, I just eat popcorn and turn off your brain kind of film. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course, you know, it's all in good taste. But uh, uh, this is a film that I think the, it's, it's a very simple script, man, but it works immensely. It takes a very simple format of an ABC sort of um, plot structure, but it works, man. All the characters in this uh, are great, are charismatic. I mean, Tom Cruise is a, is a great leading man, one of the one of the last real movie stars we actually have. But even the small performances from, you know, you have Jennifer Connelly in a small role and John Hamm, and all of the new lieutenants are great. Uh, Miles Teller is in the film, Glenn Powell, um, Monica Barbero, uh, Jay Ellis, they were all great, man. And, it, and the action sequences in this film, I mean, I didn't get an opportunity to see this in IMAX, but my gosh, man, this is one of the most enjoy. The action sequences are so enjoyable, putting the camera on the jets, the a lot of POV shots. It's just, it, this is truly, I mean... This is just truly a a a film you watch and you go, yeah, man. This is this is cinema, man. This is you can't make a film like this in any other kind of format. You just watch the film, you sit back, and you're and you just revel in the pure adrenaline and fun of this film, man. I I really I've seen this maybe three times now, and the more I watch it, the more I just the the immense just respect I have for this film and how much fun it is, man. I'm just really happy that this was uh, that this is been such a success and you know, I can't wait for the uh, next Mission Impossible as well because I mean the last three were fantastic uh, that I just rewatched the uh, Fallout for the 2018 list and it's, it's great it's so much fun uh, Triangle of Sadness I talked about as well the new um, oh, what the hell's his name I always forget his name it's, uh, something Osland uh, uh, his new film coming off of his Palm Door winning The Square uh, Ruben Osland that's it and uh, what, a, what a great film man uh, again a little too long, I, I do think, um, but what a fun and funny film, man. You know, there was another film that, that came out this year, uh, I won't say the name of that was trying, that sometimes when films try to poke at sort of bourgeois um, lifestyles and people, sometimes it can be a little a little too obvious. You know, I, I look at a lot of like the Boonwell stuff and that all works for me because he's taking a very silly kind of satirical approach for a lot of it. And a lot of films now that try to, do that, uh, they don't quite work for me. It's a little too obvious, a little too, aren't rich people, you know, snooty and dumb. So I was a little, um, when I walked into this film, I, I didn't know how on the nose it would be. And it is on the nose, but um, it is just such an enjoyable film, man. I think the first two parts of this, it was some of the best stuff I'd seen this year. All of the characters were great. And it's, it's a very silly film, but then you get, um, you know, an early scene where you have uh, the two at first, the two leads, uh, Carl and Yaya, played by Harris Dickinson and Charles B. Dean, R.I.P. Um, and they have a they have a, there's a conflict at the beginning of the film, and uh, and you you think one thing about a character, about Yaya's character, and then what the script does is that she actually confronts him and goes, you know, I was out of line for that, and I'm sorry, and let's not act like this. And I was like, wow, okay, this, another film would just be like, she's a dick and, and he, you know, and that's that man. And she does have these shallow narcissistic kind of tendencies, but these feel like real characters on top of these very heightened, very silly, uh, uh, other characters and sequences. My, my favorite sequence in the entire film is between, uh, Woody Harrelson and Zato Burek. Um, Woody Harrelson is a captain who <laughs> doesn't like seafood and doesn't want to hang out with these people. Um, and Zlat Zlato Burek from, uh, uh, Nicholas Winding reference pusher films plays Dimitri, who is, uh, has made his fortune in fertilizer and they get drunk together. And that I was, man, the, the, I mean, the, the, the visual stuff is all funny and all great, but they, but their, their dialogue back and forth, they were getting drunk and just, man, was cracking me up, man. 
Um, the third part of this film, I think, does wear it down a little bit, aside from being the most obvious um, kind of point in, in the whole film where the roles are reversed, uh, the, the hierarchies are turned on its head, the classes are, you know... I, the, while that section of the film I think is good, I think it does kind of hold it back a little bit for me because it goes on maybe a little too long. And it's weird because, you know, I, I can watch long films and they have no problem with it. But I think, but if the film is good enough, you know, if the film has to be strong to really get that out of me, you know, I just watched last night uh, Terrence Malick's A Hidden Life, which is almost three hours. And it didn't feel that long at all. You know, maybe sometimes it's like more than others. But overall, I thought, you know, a film like that, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, it works for its runtime. So it's all in the eye of the beholder. But, uh, and I'm glad to see this is getting a 4K from Criterion uh, in a couple months, which will definitely be purchased. Um, but, man, what a great film, man. I just had so much fun with this. And I really do want to see his last film, The Square. I've only seen his uh, other film, uh, Force Majeure. Uh, and I, which I thought was pretty good. I didn't love, but, um, I, I definitely enjoyed and I haven't seen his other work, um, uh, play or der off really no idea how to say that, but very good stuff overall. And then the last of these is one I just talked about last episode, so I'll be brief on, but it's Sarah Polly's new film, Women Talking. Another film that I have enjoyed much more since thinking about. Uh, interesting uh, directing choices. There's a lot of times where they cut to other sequences while the characters are talking. Uh, it's not it's a flashback, but not in a way where it slows down the film. Um, just uh, solid performances all throughout. I had mentioned before, and I initially started watching the film, I, I, was, I was thinking, oh no, are these going to be one-note performances? You have a character who's only angry, the character's only good, and it, and it doesn't do that, man. Um, all the leads in the film are great, and even all the side characters are great as well. I, I mean, I just talked about this last episode, so I don't know how much more I can really go in-depth about it. It's still fresh in my mind, and, and uh, although I'm still um, uh, have my opinions on the color palette of this film, uh, it's, it's what a great return for Sarah Pauly, man. I really hope we get more films out of her, because just a solidly directed and, and written film, also written by uh, Marion Toes. So, yeah, man, that's that. Nine... Uh, solid films. If any one of them win Best Picture, man, good. Good for them. Uh, even if Avatar wins, which I'm not really interested in, hey, man, good for them, man. James Cameron, he knows what he's doing. He makes these crazy films, and people like him. Godspeed to him, man. Uh, yeah, I had other things I was going to talk about on this episode, but I'm quickly running out of time. So, uh, man, all right, man. So, uh, a lot of these are going to be coming back to theaters, so if you haven't had the opportunity to see them, uh, and you want to go see them in theaters, man, go do it, man. You're going to be really, some of these, you're, you're going to be really uh, benefiting yourself by seeing them theatrically. But all right, man, that's all I got. You guys have a good weekend. Enjoy the rest of your week and come back next week. And I'm going to talk about some 2022 films then.